Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming this evening uh, to this lecture titled Architecture of the Imagination, Creativity in Exile During the Soviet Period. Um, this talk tonight was organized by Pushkin House in London, um, who's our neighbor relatively in um, kind of off Bloomsbury Square. And uh, it was uh, planned to coincide with an exhibition that opened there on Wednesday this week, um, titled Alexander Brodsky, 101st Kilometer, All Stations from Here Onwards, which it was scheduled to mark the 100th anniversary of the 1917 October Revolution. And um, it also includes a pavilion designed by Alexander Brodsky that is in Bloomsbury Square, like, well, on the edge of Bloomsbury Square. and. Um, it, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you have been to the book launch earlier in the AA bookshop. Uh, to, that is a kind of book of the cancel plates um, that he also designed. Um, anyway, the, tonight's talk will focus on the theme of creative practice in exile. Uh, we're going to have a few short presentations um, from the director of Pushkin House, the curator of the exhibition, and um, two sort of scholars on this period. And then we're going to break into it a bigger discussion, hopefully involving all of you. And then um, there's another opportunity to buy the book and have some drinks and continue the conversation informally at the end. Um, I don't really want to say much more because I'm sure you're anxious to hear from our speakers. So I'm going to hand things over to Marcus, who will introduce them and say a bit more about tonight's event. So please join me in welcoming our four speakers to the AA. So yes, uh, hello to everyone. My name is Markus Lähtemäki, and I'm the curator of this uh, exhibition and, and pavilion uh, with Pushkin House, Bloomsbury Square. Uh, the manager has actually said uh, the working title of the exhibition, and uh, the final title is, is uh, "101st Kilometer Further Everywhere." <coughs> and I will shortly explain what it means. <coughs> So the program for today is the following. I will speak very, very briefly uh, about the exhibition and the pavilion and, and lay the grounds on, on, on why we are here today. Because we thought with, with Clementine Cecil, the director of the Pushkin House, to, to do a sort of a parallel event here, uh, concentrating on, on architecture, uh, whereas the pavilion focuses on literature. Uh, so after me, she will, she will say some words. Uh, she has a background is in architectural preservation, and she worked long in Moscow, uh, being a, the, a key person in, in, the, in the saving many of the, the constructivist uh, monuments that, that still stand there. Uh, and she will talk about uh, Leonid Melnikov, Konstantin Melnikov, uh, and what happened to him after he was no longer able to practice freely. After that, Tom Cabin, who was a senior lecturer at, uh, at the Gothenburg Technical University, uh, whose book called uh, Soviet Critical Design will be soon out. Uh, we'll talk about the, the science cities in the Soviet Union in, uh, in, the, in the time of the thaw in the 50s and 60s as enclosures for, for creative practices. Uh, after that, we'll have Andres, Andres Kurk, who's a visiting professor and the head of art history at the Tallinn Academy of Arts, uh, who's, who has co-curated an exhibition on, on paper architectures in, in Tallinn, Moscow, and Novosibirsk, which opened a couple of weeks ago in Berlin, uh, and who's worked on, on this question of paper architectures for several years. We'll talk about paper architectures as in a, in a long, as a long narrative starting from the post-war years up until the 80s. So briefly about the pavilion and, and, and what, what does this 101st first kilometer further everywhere means. Uh, the idea for the, for the pavilion, which you can all see in Bloomsbury Square for the next three weeks, and which contains on its walls 20 poems written by uh, Russian poets living in exile of sorts. So the 101st kilometer uh, is a concept which in Russia is fairly well known. Uh, and it refers to the distance that people who were excluded from the from the society, people who uh, who were who were banned to to internal exile or, or returning from the gulag, from the labor camps, uh, were forced to live outside the cities. So it's this some sort of a a, a line around St. Petersburg, around Leningrad and Moscow, Kiev, other other major cities where these people 
criminals as well as poets or, or artists uh, had to had to live. They couldn't they couldn't move move. They couldn't be in the cities. For our exhibition uh, and project, we we uh, understood this more freely, more openly, and extended it to mean all the all the exclusion that that took took place under the subsequent regimes after the Soviet Revolution. And the history of the pavilion briefly starts with, with, uh, with discussions between Brodsky and myself uh, about this idea and, and, and me asking him what it would be to build a building, a museum, a monument, a pavilion, something around this idea. Uh, and somehow we ended up doing what you can then see now. And I won't explain it because I think it will be better, better to see without explanations. I will now briefly just tell some of the con about some of the content of the pavilion and line the discussion somehow, give the, the grounds to the discussion uh, from the side of literature, uh, which then the following speakers will extend to, to the sphere of architecture. So these 20 poets that we have in the pavilion, and there could be many more. We had a list of, of many more poets that we then cut. There was space only for 20 poems. Uh, uh, they all suffered in their lives, they all went through horrible destinies and, and, and under the regime and, and in their personal lives and, and all their voices were oppressed. They could not practice what they wanted to practice. Uh, yet all of them uh, kept on writing poetry. They kept on doing it in secret, reading it to their friends. Uh, they kept on secretly printing, uh, secretly distributing manuscript versions. Uh, and at the same time, the, the printing went on in the West uh, by, by emigre, by publishing houses set up by emigres. I'm going to give you three examples very briefly. The first one is uh, Nikolai Gumilyov, who was a, a, a poet, uh, an outspoken monarchist, who after the revolution, unlike quite many other poets actually, and, and cultural, cultural intelligentsia, did not welcome the revolution, but uh, still decided not to emigrate, but stay in, in St. Petersburg, or Petrograd, as it was then called. Uh, for his uh, monarchist uh, views, which he also expressed in his poetry, uh, he was in 1922 arrested by the Soviet secret police uh, and shot uh, dead without trial under false accusations. The second uh, example, the second poet uh, in the pavilion is Marina Tsvetaeva, uh, who also did not welcome the revolution and, and did not welcome the idea of Bolshevism uh, and decided to emigrate a few years after the, after the revolution, largely also because his, his husband, the poet Sergei Efron, was uh, fought in the White Army, so they could, couldn't, it was difficult for them to stay. They settled in, in uh, Berlin, then to Prague, then to Paris, where Marina Tsetaeva uh, fed the family by writing articles in, in the emigre and, and in the French press. She was also fluent in French. Uh, in 1939, uh, it turned out that his husband had been a Soviet spy for the past years, and they had to move back to, back to Moscow. Uh, one year later, uh, the outcome, uh, when, at the outburst of the, of the Second World War, when the Soviet Union joined it, her husband was arrested and killed. Her son was killed and she hung, hung, hung herself. A lot of her poetry from, from the 30s uh, and the 20s deals with these questions about the alienation, about the, the question of not, not belonging, not, not being able to live where you want to live. The third example uh, is uh, Osip Mandelstam, uh, who many have, have titled the greatest Russian poet of the 20th century. He too uh, did not compromise his voice and, and kept on writing with his free, free spirit, the poetry he, he had written. Not so political necessarily, but uh, in any case uh, not welcomed by the, by the authorities. He was not able to publish his poetry as many went uh, already in earlier 20s, but especially from 1928 onwards when Stalin, Stalin's first five-year year plan came, uh, started. Uh, he, however, kept on writing and he wrote uh, this famous Stalin epigram in, uh, in early 30s. Uh, this uh, ironic, somehow 
ironic and at the same time very very frank poem where he he talks about the the fat fingers of Stalin and uh, the cockroach mus uh, mustache um, he has and uh, th this the words of this got out and he was arrested and sent to to internal exile uh, he was uh, admitted to return uh, in 1937 uh, when, when it was the height of, of Stalin's terror, when hundreds of thousands were t taken from their homes and just shot or sent to Siberia. And this is exactly what, what happened to him as well. The third example, since the pavilion uh, and uh, the poems inside the pavilion cover the longer period of the, of the Soviet times, not only the 20s and 30s, uh, is uh, Joseph Brodsky, the, the Nobel laureate, who uh, in 1964, uh, was arrested uh, and put on trial, uh, which was a famous trial also in the West, where he was accused of being a parasite. So actually he was accused of being a poet, because they said, you don't have a profession. And they said, you are no poet. But he stood uh, behind his words as a, poem, as a poet, uh, and was sent to, to Arhangels, to northern, northern Russia, to, uh, to the Gulag. Uh, after his return, uh, a couple of years after his return, he, he emigrated to the West. When he was given the Nobel Prize in 1987, uh, at the beginning of his, his Nobel speech, uh, he said, and I quote, it is better to be a total failure in a democracy than a martyr or a, a creme de la creme in a tyranny. He was very much one of one a poet who, who cherished the idea of a romantic exile, somehow in the spirit of Ovid or Dante, and, and continuing through the history of literature, not uh, not only as a, as a romantic trope, but uh, but also also mostly I guess through his work, and these different ideas and images of of exile is is something I hope. Today we will we will we will hear and, and, and after the after the talks we will have some sort some sort of an idea because this question of exile and, and emigration and, and, and oppression they are of course very wide questions and, and there, are, there are many examples which are all unique and uh, Joseph Brodsky himself in a in a in a famous essay the condition called exile or as had a few years before Edward Said in his famous essay on exile both uh, uh, emphasized the fact that, that when we talk about exile, we should start with the masses, that uh, we should t talk about the big numbers of refugees, we should talk about the, uh, the foreign workers in Berlin, the, the, the Turkish foreign workers in Berlin, which was then, or we should talk about, I guess we all know the examples. Uh, however, Brodsky concludes in his essay that literature is and I quote, the only form of moral ins insurance a society has. So literature, and in today's uh, event, I hope we can access somehow how more uh, openly other creative practices have a special meaning uh, in difficult situations to carry the moral, uh, but also, I guess, some sort of practical way of life, acting as a, as a lifeline through the, through the, for, for, the, for the people who do it, as well as the people who can experience it. So I would now sort of want to pave the way to, to the three next speakers, posing some questions, which I don't expect them directly to, to answer, but I hope that that will somehow be answered, at least in part, today. So if, if literature is the, is the, um, the, the, the form, the, the, the strongest form of moral insurance a society has, what is the role of, of architecture and, and design in, in these types of practices, uh, uh, these types of situations? And uh, how in the Soviet Union in the 30s and, and after, the, after the Second World War, uh, how, how did architecture and, and, and design uh, relate to these questions? Uh, where the, what was, did it have a special uh, status somehow because of the, the means of its production and, and its role in the society? Uh, or can we find also, also these uh, paths of, of absolute freedom like some of the, the voices of the poets in the pavilion? So now, next, uh, we'll be speaking Clementine Cecil. Uh, briefly about the architect Konstantin Melikov. <laughs>
Um, hi, good evening. My name is Clem Cecil. I'm the director of Pushkin House. Um, and as Marcus said, um, before that, I was very involved in architecture and conservation in Moscow, uh, specifically in constructivism. I'm not going to speak for long because our next two speakers have got the lion's share of the evening and I don't want to eat into that too much, so I'm going to be brief. But I think it's instructive to talk about the early period of architectural practice in the Soviet Union to talk about how that kind of paved the way for the paper architects. Um, and it's very interesting that some of the questions that Marcus posed just there. Um, I don't know how much any of you know about Konstantin Melnikov, but I, I certainly don't think that he held any kind of moral line in the Soviet time. And, um, and I was thinking as you were speaking, you know, why didn't he emigrate actually? Because in 1925, he constructed the, the pavilion in Paris at the um, Exhibition des Arts Décoratives, and he won this commission having designed Lenin's sarcophagus in 1924. And a lot of people think that's why he was never sent to the Gulag, because he was later very persecuted, which I'll go on to talk about. But um, so he had this incredible feeling for the sort of dynamism and energy of, of the Soviet time. I mean, that's just the construction site, but some of you might know the building. It, he was very good at, he manifested this sort of en energy uh, and these sort of paradoxical, um, the sort of forward thrust of the revolutionary period. But he wasn't political. He wasn't a socialist or a communist particularly. Um, but just to show you some of the workers' clubs, he was the most prolific and commissioned architect of the 20s. Uh, he built seven workers' clubs. This is the Rusikov. Oh, hang on. Um, and that's the Kauchuk. I really like this photograph, and I wonder if that might be him even looking at it. I don't know if it is. Um, and you can see, those of you who don't know his work, there's a kind of harmony and a dynamism in them, a symmetry and a kind of explosive quality. And then, of course, like a true bourgeois, actually, he built his own house. So he, he, within very few years of starting architectural practice in 1927, was given a plot of land in the centre of Moscow to build his own house. Um, and this is the construction site. And over the top of it, it says Konstantin Melnikov architect. So this is extreme individualism. And um, so he was given this two years after he got back from Paris, and he was absolutely fated in Paris. And he was definitely offered the chance by the emigre community to emigrate, and he chose not to take it. And I wonder if this is because he, he was edu highly educated, but he was, from a, he was from a peasant family, and he was adopted by the merchants who he worked for as a messenger boy who recognized his talent for drawing and who sent him to architecture and art school. And I don't know. He, he didn't really have that kind of world, that kind of expansive or international world view. So that's why I think he stayed in Russia. So um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about Melnikov was that, and this is him on his roof, and is that, um, so for the purposes of today, I'll just say um, how it was that he was scapegoated, really, and forced to stop working, even despite his incredibly starry beginning and how he was sort of the architect of the early years of the revolution. Um, in 1927, with the first five-year plan, architecture was degraded in some ways, to, and the engineer was upgraded and became more important as the kind of economic driver, and architecture became kind of more ornamental in some ways. Um, Melnikov was not a team player. He didn't ally himself with the constructivists or any of the other architectural groupings. And again, maybe this was kind of his lack of sophistication and sort of society know-how. He didn't really know how to do that, and he wasn't interested in doing that. And um, so he was called a formalist. And Milutin, who was Minister of Housing, who commissioned Narkomfin from Ginsberg, called him an extremist. But actually, the thing I'd like to convey is just how random the um, per nature of the persecution was. And you look at the poets in the pavilion in Bloomsbury Square at the moment, it's very random who was persecuted and why they were persecuted. It was often because someone just simply didn't like them. You know, we as people looking at Russia, we want to hang on to certain landmarks of dates and things like that. And this year, Stalin said this, and in that year, this happened. But actually, there's a, also a very personal, random element. And um, I'm afraid Melnikov didn't have the wherewithal, or the kind of, and he was terribly proud, the ability to defend himself. And um, he became a kind of scapegoat. <clears throat> 
And there was a witch hunt that started in 1929 of lo lots of articles against him. I'll just quote from one of them. Um, even the most sickly manifestations of the medieval imagination in the most morose fantasies of Bosch pale before his disgusting structures in which every humane concept of architecture is turned upside down. So, you know, he was up against this really sort of very kind of um, emotion, well, sort of bile, this terrible bile. In 1932, all architectural groupings were banned and the Union of Soviet Architects was created with the task of defining a new Soviet architecture. But the truth was they didn't have a single, they, they didn't have one unified idea for what that would be. And it's much easier to scapegoat um, somebody. I'm simplifying a bit, but just to, to give a sort of general idea. Um, and this was the time when the terror was, was growing, um, and he was in good company. I mean, other people accused of formalism included Shostakovich, Pasternak, Ehrenburg, um, and in 1937 he was publicly denounced by an architect called Karo al uh, Bian, and this is him at the um, 1937 Congress of Architects. So we're in the height of the terror now, and he's accusing Malnikov of formalism and bourgeois behaviour. Um, so he was banned from building at this time and he wanted to adapt socialism. He wanted to adapt to the changing times but he just wasn't allowed to so his architectural practice was closed down by this point. He'd been struggling for a while and he was basically under house arrest after that. This is him in his house and he was there um, he died in 1974, but with the thaw um, in the 50s, uh, things lifted a bit. And in the, in the 60s, his, his home became something of a pilgrimage site, a kind of shrine to this idea of the early avant-garde. And he, was, he saw himself absolutely as a victim. And he worked into, in his desk, as the expression is, Rabot it for stall. And this is one of the designs he did. He tried to take part, but his designs were not were not accepted and this was his design for the Ministry of Heavy Industry on Red Square. Um, but because he didn't build anything, his architectural legacy has a kind of purity about it because it was only in this quite short period in the 20s. Um, he had an exhibition of his work at the Architects Union in 1965 which he mounted himself. It was up for four days and then he died nine years later and there was a kind of rehabilitation of him. Um, but I think it's useful to, um, to have as background um, because in terms of what Marcus was saying, I think that there were no poetry came out of him after the 20s. And, um, but his is a life of suffering and it shows how destructive this kind of uh, gagging is on an architect. And, but I think later with the paper architects, they... Um, that some kind of more humane balance came into their work and some kind of poetry came through. But we'll hear, for, hear about that now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus, for the invitation to speak here today, and thank you for the opportunity to view um, a very moving pavilion. Oh, what's that doing? Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you for the um, for the opportunity to, to view an incredibly moving pavilion. It's worth uh, setting aside an hour and a half or so to, to go through and, 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 and read the, the poems in there. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, um, the idea of the science city as a model for um, how the experience of the creative intelligentsia could be materialized in late socialism. Um, so Freedom of Thought wrote the Soviet dissident Andrei Sakharov in, 19, in 1968 
is the only guarantee of a scientific democratic approach to politics, economics, and culture. In his essay, Progress, Coexistence, and Intellectual Freedom, which was circulated in Samizdat form among the Soviet intelligentsia, Sakharov emphasized how freedom and openness were lacking on both sides of the global political divide. And following the distribution of this essay, Sakharov was banned from conducting military research and became one of the founding members of the USSR Committee on Human Rights. However, Sakharov's vision of intellectual freedom was not rooted in fantasy. Sakharov was part of an intellectual milieu that had experienced the Khrushchev thaw of the 1950s and the 1960s, a heady post-Stalin years that were characterized um, for many by a belief in the possibility of the creative construction of communism. And the Soviet city of science was an important uh, product of de-Stalinization under Khrushchev. The Soviet scientific city of Akadem Gorodok uh, was founded outside of Novosibirsk in Siberia in 1957 and was the brainchild of uh, Mikhail Lavrentiev, a mathematician whose vision was to open an interdisciplinary research center that would enable the development of Soviet science far from the doctrinal wranglings of the Moscow branch of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. And so from 1961 to 1968, Akadem Gorodok stood at the forefront of attempts to decentralize Soviet science and create new forms of lateral communication between scientists. And the metaphors that were associated with cybernetics and decentralized command and control systems were also applied to the metaphor of an intellectual milieu that could produce the knowledge for constructing communism. So though it wasn't necessarily architecturally thrilling, Akadem Gorodok's location in Novosibirsk's Golden Valley was supposed to provide a natural setting of forested walks and cross-country skiing as a setting for conversations among scientists of different disciplines. And the sociologist Yuri Sheshin wrote about these cities in 67. He said, scientific centers are not simply appendages to large-scale machine production. In several decades' time, such centers will be the focus of all social production. So the three projects I'm going to talk about imagine the city of science in different ways following uh, Sakharov's 1968 publication, the Prague Spring, and the reassertion of ideological control over Soviet science. So as sites of development for uh, de-alienated and intellectualized labor of scientific and technical elites, the scientific city was an object of interest among Soviet architects and designers who sought to imagine an information age socialism where urban infrastructure and telecommunications could support a new kind of, so of post-industrial city. So in 1986, the Sovietologist uh, Donald Kelly argued that Soviet attempts to reinterpret the conventional understanding about the nature of industrial society in the light of the Second Revolution which was led by advances in science, technology, and communications, led to a set of predictions about the future state of communist society that were surprisingly similar to those popularized by the American New Left during the 60s. This is people like Daniel Bell and Marshall McLuhan. So central to Daniel Bell's theory of the post-industrial society was this idea of the emergence of a new social stratum of, uh, and cultural attitude among the professional classes and technical elites. Um, and so there are many, you can see many similarities to Bell's discussions of the post-industrial society and um, the doctrinal development of ideas around the intellectualization of labor um, of the highly educated Soviet workforce. And so these types of decentralized information networks and constellations um, present in these prophets of post-industrialism was uh, mirrored, as I'm sure many of you know, um, in the architectural sphere by the likes of Archigram and Team 10 in the West, who were concerned with how technology might create cities that would be more adaptable to economic and social change than the post-war uh, modernist town. Um, so the development of a project for a domestic information machine at the Soviet Institute for Technical Aesthetics um, was inspired by, partly by Archigram, uh, House Rooker, and, and um, uh, elements of the 60s avant-garde. 
and writings on information age socialism that emerged alongside the Brezhnev era doctrine of developed socialism of gradual social change. So, um, so here you can see the kind of information network that might form the hardware for networks of technical elites across the USSR. And so discussions of how this kind of hardware could support an information age socialism um, began at this Institute for Technical Aesthetics, which was the major design institute in the USSR. This began in, uh, as part of a report into the future of the zone of mental labor in the home. Um, so the possibilities for a new kind of information service in the home were predicted in the results of a survey by journalists at the Novosti newspaper. Um, um, in 1966, and it was envisaged that by 2017, every newspaper subscriber will have a special piece of apparatus in their home which will print an edition of the newspaper at a the touch of a button. So the author's report said, it is fully possible that such a communication system could exist not only in conjunction with the publishers of newspapers and magazines, but with scientific libraries, archives, museums, repositories of musical recordings and films. In an ideal situation, man could almost instantly receive all necessary information in the form of text on paper, on a screen or a sound, sitting at the workstation and without leaving home. So at um, Girikond, who were the State Research Institute for Resistors and Capacitors, um, they were based in, in Leningrad, initial research um, into the domestic information machine um, was underway in the late 60s, and they published an article um, in the magazine Electronic Industry entitled What is DEEM, to stand for the domestic information machine. And it was presented um, by the authors as a way of dealing with the information overload, one of the kind of key, um, key predictions of the post-industrial profits. Um, so this idea that you could choose information and filter information some way with the machine seemed very appealing to, to, these, to these engineers. Um, but um, the, um, so three, um, Architects and designers worked on this project. There was the architect Alexander Ryabushin, uh, Vladimir Papany, who went on to write the famous book Culture Two, and um, and the graphic designer Yevgeny Bogdanov worked on a project for the domestic information machine as part of the uh, of the futurological um, section of the Department for Household Goods within Vnita. So their concept for this machine was inspired by. Uh, silver knife rests that you might see in, in kind of aristocratic homes which were turned up on end and these containers would enable you to hold the television and equipment and things and and kind of bring create a totally flexible media environment in the home um, and this theme was directly inspired by uh, by Archigram's plug and clip dwelling um, the term clip-on um, was lauded by Alexander Rebushin as the basic principle which allows for maximally dynamic solutions in the contemporary age. And so his commentary expresses an excitement about the possibilities of going beyond architecture towards a comfortable environment regulated by supporting hardware. So on Archigram, Rebushin wrote, the most valuable aspects of these designs lies in the plan for a dynamically adapted living environment which is organized by function and regulated all of its parts. Whereas, um, uh, speaking to Vladimir Papany, he says the idea for him was that they really just wanted to show that they were, they were on the same wavelength as these kind of cool architects. Um, but Rabushin presented this idea as, as a kind of, as a concept in the early 70s, which he called domestic theater. Um, and these, these graphics were produced by, by Evgeny Bogdanov, and, um, and they kind of produced this kind of cool 60s counterculture typography. And this was presented as a possible solution to the commodity problem. Um, so they cited a uh, fourfold output in consumer goods in the 60s, which compared to a 14 to 16% increase uh, 
in average living space since the 1960s. And Rabushin declared that the traditional structure of the domestic environment will be blown apart from the inside by an abundance of things. So, the, so here you can see a kind of direct descendant of ideas from, um, from Soviet productivism of the 1920s, where things are hidden away and they own, their form only materializes when you need them. So you won't look at things and fall in love with them. You'll just have the useful effects of things. Um, and they developed this project over several years. Um, the second version of the domestic information machine went a little bit further. And so here you just float in the environment that's produced by the information and music and light that you select to produce your home. And this is not determined by architects or planners or anyone else. So extrapolating from this original conception, they said a total system of electronic control and management in the home could control the psychological climate as well as the material space conditions and parameters of the microclimate. So these projects position the home firstly as a way of filtering information because of the information overload they were, they were seeing was, was, was a part of the process of, 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 of creating a post-industrial society. But we can also sense um, um, some, maybe some waves from California and counterculture. This is a kind of extremely individualist, potentially libertarian uh, kind of concept. Um, and yeah, so we feel this kind of turn on, tune in, drop out idea in your kind of deem inspired home. And this was carried on in some of uh, Bogdanov and Vladimir Papany's work. This was, um, um, designed for an isolosphere, an isolation ball, which was kind of made of chairs in your home, which you could then construct and hide from the Soviet Union. Um, so Rabushin said, the home is becoming an active means for providing the regulation and filtration of surplus information and, uh, and contact. So therefore, if mass communications could be built into the structure of housing, there would um, be able to use the protective properties of buildings to isolate you from the outside. Um, so, and these projects were being developed at the same time that the, the modernist micro district was becoming um, one of the kind of major forces in, in, in Soviet urban planning where you would have uh, concrete blocks with rational distribution of schools and shops or or so it would work in theory. Um, Rabushin was interested in how urban sociologists were looking at these scientific cities and how socialization was actually occurring. So one sociological study of how and with whom the town's inhabitants spent their free time concluded that socialization based on territorial proximity would be unsuitable for a city inhabited by a highly educated workforce. So here we see number one is the most educated uh, people and number four are the least educated people. And they found that the, the less educated you are, the more likely you were to speak to your neighbors. And that educated people would spend time in the, in the Dormul Chorni, the house of, of, of scholars. Um, so Rabushin cited this study in order to add weight to his early arguments that the social effects of the scientific technological revolution would mean that we'd need to find more suitable urban structures and hardware um, for the development of the city of the future. He said the only thing taken into account of the organization of neighborly contact is territorial proximity. Community interests and professional qualities are not considered. The micro district is only convenient for the elderly who have left the sphere of professional contact or for children whose relations can be restricted to games in the yard. Um, so conceptualizing the home in this way is clearly based on the continuation of the Soviet intelligentsia's call for these, these kind of decentralized um, information networks uh, and, and avoiding this kind of centralized uh, structures of knowledge and control. Um, so another proposition um, for the media environment in a post-authoritarian city can be seen in the design of uh, Mayakovsky Square in central Moscow which was produced by members of the Soviet Union of Artists at the uh, Central Experimental Studio. Um, so this project was led by an artist called Mark Kornick, 
who ran 90-day educational seminars um, for artists at a retreat outside of Moscow. And these artists were usually responsible for producing propaganda and visual agitation and kind of local um, displays in towns from ac across the USSR. And they came and worked together on these, on these experimental projects. Um, so Mayakovsky Square was a project they worked on in 1977. And I'll just give you a little bit of background to the significance of Mayakovsky Square for the Soviet intelligentsia. So on the 28th of June, 1958, a statue of the futurist poet Mayakovsky was unveiled on the square. And the Mayakovsky legend animated a lot of the contradictions of the, of the Thor of the, of the 50s and 60s. So the intelligentsia lauded him for his sincerity and for his creativity, and as well as the contempt he showed um, for the regime and his refusal to adapt to Stalin's cultural policies. He also reflected for the government of the 50s the need to loosen ideological control, as well as the risk that this could open a Pandora's box of more significant challenges to the regime. So on the day of the statue's unveiling, uh, invited individuals read aloud the poetry of Mayakovsky in a literary concert. But after the official part of these celebrations were over, people continued to read other unsanctioned poems. And this began to develop into, um, into a regular meeting place for the reformist youth of the Thor. And there started to form these different groups who were interested in aspects of history and philosophy, politics, I think one group was interested in medieval law. Um, and these groups formed on the, on the square. It was, and um, Vladimir Bukovsky, the leading dissident of the 60s and 70s, said about this. He said, a multitude of incredibly diverse people began to assemble on the Mayak, Mayakovsky Square. There were young people everywhere who were interested in unofficial and semi-official poetry. The poetry readings right there on the square in the middle of the city produced an extraordinary atmosphere. However, when news of these gatherings reached the foreign press in 1961, the KGB put an end to the meetings and, de uh, uh, and denounced the leaders in the press. And an attempt to revive these meetings by Alexander Galanskov and Yuri Ginsburg in the mid-60s led to one of the biggest show trials of that decade. So this 1977 project led by Mark Kornick tried to reimagine what the square would look like. And it took its inspirations from, um, from theatre surrounding the, the square. So the approach, um, you can see all these kind of court jesters. There's, uh, the theatres were to be reconfigured and decorated with murals of Shakespeare. And the square was to be covered with this in a layer of golden blocks that could be raised or lowered by pneumatics. And a colored light was to be positioned on top of each of these blocks. Um, and so this, was, this colored system of pneumatic blocks was about producing an adaptable environment according to those principles of flexibility that you saw in, in, the, in the domestic information machine. But this is put into an urban context. Um, and then the changing of colored lights was also to enable the, the mood to be changed depending on the occasion. And so this use of light and color and adaptable staging was part of an attempt to bring theater back to the street. Um, so the square was conceived as a site of information exchange and the embodiment of information networks that extended far beyond the reach of the party. In an article about this project, the philosopher Karl Cantor questioned whether mass media produced the need for a public square. And so he cited um, modern mass media um, and communications as a reason for the decline of the square as a site of collective communication. He said, today, in order to enter into universal communication, man must turn to sources of mass information, to radio, television, and newspapers. And to do this, he doesn't need to go to the square, but leave it and remove himself from the spider's web of anonymous contacts. Breaking himself away from the limited and spontaneous gathering of people on the square in domestic solitude, man finds the possibility of entering into enriching, albeit in direct contact with the entire world. And to do that, man no longer needs a square. 
And so there's a hint of irony here, because he really means that man can no longer go to a square in order to experience um, this type of social engagement. It was kitchen table conversations and Samizdat publications were the main media that supported uh, discourse in unofficial areas of academia by the late 70s. And the mass media of television to which one may retreat was also heavily state controlled but was also a, strangely a subject of concern by the authorities who worried that television would engender passivity in the viewer because it in required no engagement with the physical world. So the reader could infer that the urban environment may enable citizens to escape the influence of mass media through participation in alternative um, formal networks. You can see also in this project um, these figures which were cut and pasted from Bruegel's uh, children's games, which was part of a kind of major movement within design and architecture in the 70s, which, um, which had kind of very strong links to the revival of, of uh, um, an interest in Italian Renaissance architecture in the West. Um, so the ideal of the Renaissance city also tapped into discourses on the ideal of humanist collectivity that the reader could infer was denied by the authorities' grip on public space and life. And the art historian uh, Maria Belyaeva explains how, in this decade, a young generation of artists turned to metaphor and intellectual play, to mysticism and the theatricalization of reality to aesthetic and narrative retrospection. So in the design for Mayakovsky Square, theatricalization of the environment was supposed to facilitate this human interaction and discovery of culture, ideas, and knowledge. And the philosopher Karl Cantor directly compared the experience of the Thor to the Renaissance rediscovery of antiquity as a time when the circulation of suppressed books, poems, and histories on Mayakovsky Square um, um, was, 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 was briefly possible. And this project is kind of nostalgic for that very brief period. Um, so while these Bruegel figures represent an idealization of the Renaissance urban collective, the system of pneumatic blocks and lights upon which they're placed resembles a modern multimedia environment. And the stage they inhabit resembles a theater that was designed by the Polish architect, Oskar Hansen. And this was the unrealized design for the Josef Seiner studio in Warsaw that was composed of, of movable platforms that could be adjusted to meet the specific needs of a production. And this was designed to facilitate the uh, Seiner's concept of open theater, which was about breaking down the fourth wall and removing any borders between the actor and the spectator. So at the Seiner studio, technology was engaged in the theater as an affirmation of life, and his shows used music, sound, life, gymnastic rituals, and Baroque visual inventions to explore the relationship between biography, creativity, and history. And it feels like in the description of these events, and I haven't seen any recordings, but they sound very like, uh, similar to some of the multimedia happenings that were by then a mainstay of US counterculture and that theme of, of individual autonomy through the production of, of, of these kind of environments and surrounds. Um, of course, there's an irony at the center of this project. Um, Soviet official doctrine defined uh, science as a direct productive force that would produce the transition to communism. And this was enshrined in the ideology of the scientific technological revolution. And here they build a kind of super technological structure that would only work in a free society. It couldn't function under communism. It wouldn't move. Um, so, um, and the final project I'm going to discuss today relates to um, another project. Uh, it's another project by Senna Studio that was developed for the biologist city of Pushima um, uh, in the Moscow region in 1984. And so in 1984, Sinus designers engaged in a collaboration with the Soviet Academy of Sciences on a project that was entitled The Ecology of a Town. And they produced a series of, uh, of designs as part of the UNESCO Man and Biosphere Project, which had begun in 71. And designers suggested various ways of configuring the landscape, nature, and parks 
in order to stimulate forms of natural consciousness in the individual. So here they examine the concept of cultural ecology for the first time, which was a coin termed by the Russian nationalist liberal and heritage campaigner Dmitry Likhachov to denote the coming together of architecture, art, literature, and language within principles of natural ecology and science. But Likhachov had proposed cultural ecology in 1979 as a field of research that would support the ethical significance and the influence upon humanity of the whole cultural environment in all its interconnections. So it's trying to find some other kind of meta-theory of existence. And this would involve connecting broad areas of knowledge, including the preservation of national cultures, craft, agriculture, natural resource development, education, engineering, arts, and environmental protection. And at the heart of ecology of culture is the desire to understand the interconnectedness of human culture and geological and biological processes of, of this total theory of human existence. So Pushino, where they were working, had been designated a science city in 1956 and was home to the Soviet Institute of Biophysics and the Pushina Scientific Center for Biological Research. The town had been constructed according to principles of Soviet modernist planning that included landscaping, but the green areas had really been designed from the point of view of the plan rather than the pedestrian's point of view. And Kornick, the head of the studio, saw that nature in Pushina for biologists functioned on a rather conceptual level in the minds of the inhabitants. But the greenery in the city had only a symbolic value that didn't equate to an ecological consciousness in daily life. He said, it's easier to love humanity than one individual concrete person. And this, in my view, is also the case with nature. Um, so this spatial fragmentation of the city caused by the urban plan meant that there were few outdoor spaces that would facilitate these kind of individual encounters with one another or with the natural environment. Um, so how could designers inspire an intellect, how could an intellectual love of nature inspire an ecological consciousness within the city itself? So the, the compositional exercises which they generally undertook as the kind of first stage of a project in this studio, tried to imagine the tree as a, as a, as a cultural form. Um, and these were one of the participants, Ihor Prokopenko's. Um, so some people familiar with Soviet architecture might recognize uh, Dvizhenia inspired tree. And then this is a tree on the, on the Pioneers Parade, answer number seven. But this, the Pushina project continued in the vein of previous work, which was about stimulating um, urban life and spontaneity through a diversity of spatial experience. Um, but this time using spatial elements. Um, so one thing they noticed in the city that it was lacking a square. There was just a giant meadow in the center of the city. He said a city without a square is a city without a soul. But maybe this gigantic meadow, meadow in the center of the city is the heart and soul of Pushina. We've kept the meadow and created a human scale square hung, uh, sunk into the meadow. So this was the view, you would just see this meadow, but inside was this kind of secret square where you could converse and meet with people. And this was based on the, uh, the legend of the invisible city of Kitej, which people might know from the Rimsky-Korsakov opera. Um, and this kind of animates the, the uh, unprepossessing uh, environment of the, of the Russian landscape. And it says the landscape's really ugly, but inside we have these kind of secret, wonderful places that if you have the cultural knowledge, uh, you're able to find them. So this is where these noble scientists could meet. And it was interrupted. Um, the flatness of the meadow was only interrupted by a sculpture of uh, Alexei Balotov, um, who was a... 18th century Russian horticulturalist who had introduced English gardening styles to, um, to Russia in the 1800s. And he viewed uncultivated nature as boring and gloomy, and that the countryside with unadorned structures could be quite ugly. And so um, Andres Scholner has written about Balotov that he stands at the beginning of an anti-environmentalist practice of aggressive interference into the course of nature. Um, so in response to the issue around um, 
the lack of intimate spaces within nature, they also produced this cascade of parks, which, was, which drew on these gardening traditions to create intimate and different kinds of spatial experience where you would be able to have different forms of conversation. So it's actually quite similar in some ways to this project for Mayakovsky Square, but put into this realm of ecological consciousness and the idea of, um, of ecology of culture. So the implication is that without a designed landscape to foster creativity among sections of the society, we're left with a bareness expressed in the landscape and the Soviet modernist city. So the three projects that um, I've looked at today are part of a phenomenon that I'm exploring in my book, which I, uh, which I call the communist surround. So while these um, projects don't support communist party ideology, they appropriate a central aspect of Marxist-Leninist thinking uh, around uh, revolutionary consciousness in Abshinia, which Andres is going to discuss in his paper. But we can see how this idea of consciousness is transformed into a product of the infrastructure that stimulates the development of a new type of open society um, through, the, um, through the form of the, of the infrastructure that supports human communication. So this type of society that would enable, in Sakharov's words, a scientific democratic approach to politics, economics and culture was drawn from those social and information networks that emerged during the thaw. So the communists around was the phenomenon of imagining how such environments might be materialized in an open society. Thank you. So um, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm also, as Tom already uh, indicated, staying on the same territories. Um, I try to be quick, but I have a, also papers, so let's see how it goes. Um, did the Second World in the post-Stalin era give rise to an everyday culture that was considerably different from the ones in the First and the Third World? Or did the specific features of the Soviet modernity, state ownership of land, full employment, absence of market economy, produce its own ways of acting and conduct that would help to shed light on this everyday culture? And if yes, can we consider this as something instigated and promoted by the state? Or did it also include the opposition to the official ideology, something that thrived regardless of the state and its policies? On the face of it, it seems that the Russian term abshenia, referring simultaneously to intercommunication, conversation, and spending time together, could offer one entrance point to the analysis of this second world culture. Literary critics Piotr Weil and Alexander Genis wrote in the 1980s about the cult of obscenia in the 1960s, relating it to the practices in the unofficial and dissident sphere. During perestroika, Abshenia was described as a substitute for religion and portrayed as the only valuable way of existence that defined all other spheres and meanings. Several authors describing retrospectively the late Soviet period have emphasized the correlation of domestic interiors and the personal interiority that was communicated to the circle of friends relating this to the practice of Abshenia. Uh, as Don Nafus said, kitchens symbolized the kind of intimacy that could be achieved in such a context, sitting at the table and sharing food were embodied ways of opening up to each other. I want to juxtapose to this anthropological viewpoint of Abshenia the way the same term emerged in the 1960s in discussions of uh, communist urban planning and in relation to both Marxist theory of ideology as well as communication theory and psychology. 
Uh, and I will concentrate on two cases. Uh, the first one represents the defining moment for the uh, use of Obscene in planning in the mid-1960s in theories for future communist city by the group Nier. And the second shows the long afterlife of this concept in the 1980s in the way it reappeared in the conceptual competition um, of the old Soviet magazine Ar Architectura SSSR. So this is about the paper architecture period. In 1966, a book titled The New Unit of Settlement Towards the New City. Um, in, in this book, members of the Moscow architecture group NER, or New Unit of Settlement, Nove Elementra Selenia, uh, outlined the theory of settlement for the new communist society. Relying on the Marxist idea of the social progression of history, they critiqued the existing forms of settlement that did not distinguish themselves in their setup and structure from the social relations of previous epochs and launched, launched a search for new principles of design. Uh, so the Nier group originated from the Moscow Architecture Institute, where a company of students, um, including Alexei Gutnov, um, uh, Ilya Lezhava, Zoya Haritonova, had in the late 1950s collaborated on a diploma project seeking solutions to problems of growth and overpopulation. Corresponding well to the prevalent attitudes of the time, the group also included a sociologist, Georgi Dumenton, who was the architect's colleague from the Department of Marxist-Leninist Philosophy and History, and who provided the group with theoretical background for their architectural research. Um, the group's project which was also titled NER, or New Unit of Settlement, led after graduation to a conceptual proposal for a new communist city, which developed alongside wide linear uh, transportation channels, or as they called it, riverbeds of settlement. You can see the riverbed of settlement here. And um, con that, uh, the linear part containing factories, science centers, and research institutes, and from where branched off um, circular residential areas for 100,000 people with housing, educational, and leisure facilities. These, were, these units were also titled NERS, or New Units of Settlement. The latter were oriented for pedestrian um, traffic as a, zone peaceful, as a zone of peaceful living, learning, growth, and quietude in, contra in contrast to the active and fast-paced riverbed. In the 1966 book, the starting point for the authors in their analysis of communist urban life and the construction of a general functional model of the future city, as they called it, was the role of interpersonal communication um, in everyday life. In order to define a relationship which could be objectively measured in time and space, they turned to Marxist and Engels' German ideology. Um, they, and there's a quote. Um, Sorry, I'm fast. Um, so there's a quote that they um, refer to Marx in this book. Thus it is quite obvious from the start that there exists a materialistic connection of men with one another, which is determined by their needs and their mode of production, and which is as old as men themselves. This connection is ever taking on new forms and thus presents a history, says Marx and Engels in, in German ideology. And they call this kind of connection intercourse, or verkehr, or in the Russian translation, abshenia. Um, the, term it's, uh, the term which in German could be also translated as traffic appeared often in German ideology, but disappeared in Marx's later writings. Uh, in German ideology, it was used in a very broad sense, signifying material relations of exchange or commerce, like barter, uh, but also spiritual relations. Uh, relations between countries, like war, uh, and so on. As the, main, as the main emphasis of the book was to show the dependence of consciousness from material circumstances, then also in the case of Verkehr, or, or intercourse, as it was quite um, unfortunately translated by the Progress publishers in the 1930s, uh, the authors showed its reliance on material practices. And so here, um, so the production of ideas of conceptions of consciousness is at first directly interwoven with the material activity uh, and the material intercourse of men, the language of real life. Conceiving thinking, uh, the mental intercourse of men appear at this stage as the direct efflux of their material behavior. 
Later commentators have emphasized that the complexity of the term was demonstrated by its reference uh, to commerce uh, or exchange, how it referred both to the productive and the communicative elements of their relation. Um, so what was at stake in Marx's discussion is how to keep both aspects together, how the social nexus takes form rather than reducing it to the strictly economic realm. Um, so this meaning of intercourse or obscenia as a material process was developed further by Nier in a chapter based on the work of Dumenton, who aimed to link the Marxist, uh, humanist Marxist with contemporary achievements um, in cybernetics and information theory, psychology and design. He stated that intercourse allowed to describe the social sphere in metric units uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand to work out a unified approach to all sides of social life as forms of intercourse, opening up a path for its qualitative measurement. So he was referring on the one hand side to Claude Shannon and Norbert Wiener, um, but uh, he proposed to update their methods by taking into account the relationship between people entering into the information net network, combining the informational model of communication with what he called the general functional model of reproduction of human beings in the system of forms of communication. That's a very kind of bureaucratic speak. Uh, Jumenton aimed to highlight the specific connection between the structural units of society. So he selected a list of stereotypical stages of formation of personality, like youth, communi communication with relatives, communication between children, education, work, free time, consumption, communication between genders. And the way these models were fed into spatial planning were further clarified in the book um, in several diagrams. So actually, it has to be said about this uh, 1966 book by Nerd that it has very little images. So it, it's a book about the future cities, but it actually doesn't show what the future city will look like. It, it uh, tells, it tries to tell it through, through diagrams and text. Um, so the first simple diagram of communicative process with, with a send between the sender, receiver, and the channel showed how the optimal organization of the environment as the channel would take into account the specific features of the intercourse or communication, thus leading to a decrease uh, in the loss of information. So we see like two, uh, two versions in the first uh, version. The environment has not taken uh, into account the specificity of the communication, and there's a loss of information um, as a result of that. Um, so uh, another diagram illustrated the ways in which forms of intercourse were historically related to forms of settlement. Uh, there was a polis in slave society, there was an agglomeration in monopoly capitalism, um, and the form of, the form of production influenced the settlement through the form of intercourse dominating in the given society. For the coming so communist society, the dominant form of communication was seen to be creative communication. So the, the last part would be the dissolution of the capitalist city into uh, uh, kind of the, the merger of the town and the country in this uh, creative uh, communication. Um, yeah, here, here comes the quite unfortunate translation of the term because it, creative intercourse already gets a different kind of un, um, uh, these kind of uh, associations. Um, and thus the architects had to work towards actualizing its corresponding form of settlement. So that's in a way kind of setting the grounds for the future work. And this was further developed in the third diagram, showing how stereotypical forms of communication under communism were related to specific spatial settings. Communication between mother and child taking place at home and in the kindergarten. So here we have like the different forms, the stereotypical communi communicative situations and the spatial context where they would happen. So you have communication between the mother and child um, taking place um, at home and in the kindergarten. Um, the, um, consumption taking place at home and in the urban and agricultural service centers. And um, the last one 
um, actually is a communication between sexes taking place at home in nature and in the park. Uh, so this, in a way, was the starting model to uh, develop this functional uh, settlement program. A special chapter of the book, titled Free Communication, or Sobodne Abshenia, was devoted to the housing complex organized as autonomous pedestrian um, uh, units of settlement and concentrated around the center for free communication. Um, this was a three-story rectangular building in this book. There's a photograph of the model consisting of two parallel strips of spaces on all sides, the outer one housing a double-height exhibition halls, classrooms and activity rooms, and the inner one designated for reading rooms, storage of information and laboratories. So in a way, coming quite close to the 1920s social uh, container um, typology, but not this reference is not spelled out there. Between the two volumes were separate sculptural auditoria, a planetarium, sports hall, a swimming pool. In the author's words, this kind of club allowed to pursue specific cultural interests, seminars on chosen topics, conferences, debates, discussion, and free conversation. There can be informative exhibitions showing the results of any particular inquiry or reflecting the activities of its members, as the book put it. And there's a large rectangular plaza in the middle designated for free communication of free citizens in the setup not unlike a Greek marketplace or agora, uh, here, however, subtracted from its uh, function of commer commerce or commercial exchange. Um, but the free communication, quite interestingly, did not, Sobodne Abshenia, then did not only include collective spaces. Uh, in one image of the book, we can see a man sitting alone in the large open space of his apartment, stretching through the whole depth of the building and enjoying a view that extends from the old glass walls of his home. In the earlier chapter, the book explains that um, uh, and here's the quote in Russian, also withdrawal can be seen as a form of free communication, Svobodne uh, Abshenia, that is organically related to work and study in the free time, to contemplation and evaluation of any phenomena, assign, assignment or act of a, connect, of a concerned person. So that for a member of NER who took part in the activities in the Center of Free Communication, Contemplative thinking of withdrawal was an extension of the discussion and self-development. In this way, free communication tied the community together, not only through common activities, but also common concerns. Um, in the following years, uh, the NER project was taken further in several exhibition projects and presentations. In 1968, an extended version of the project which I'm not going to go into, was shown on the fourth, um, at, the, at the 14th Milan Trinale in 1970. The so-called NER II was shown in Osaka World Expo and so on. Um, but I want to fast forward from here to the early 1980s and bring the discussion uh, on Abshenia uh, or communication together with the phenomena of paper architecture that emerged in Moscow during these years. If in contrast to the visionary approach of the 1960s, this decade has been seen as a, as a withdrawal and ironic distancing from an active political discussion uh, that has been characterized as, as uh, in the kind of dissident Obscenia version. It also demonstrated the long afterlife of the term as it was used in the works of Nier. Um, so at the end of the 1970s and early 1980s, a new generation of architects emerged, emerged in Moscow, positing a critique of the architectural establishment, mass housing, and displaying a shift in approach to design practice in the works. Trained in the Moscow Architecture Institute, uh, they already became known during their studies for their successful entries in international architecture competitions organized, among others, by UNESCO and the, uh, uh, and the Association of Scenographers. Uh, their project gradually inaugurated a whole genre of competition architecture characterized by unexpected ju juxtapositions of Soviet reality with fantastic architectural solutions. They emphasized the narrative content of the design and architecture indexing change over time. <clears throat> 
So numerous works were sent to conceptual competitions sponsored by journals like Japan Architect or Architectural Design, where um, also in 1981, the Architects' Union started to approve participation in international com conceptual competitions uh, for its members um, and several teams of Russian architects were um, successful in this competition over, over many years. So recognizing that the phenomenon of paper project had gained significant following and threatened to slip away from the institutional radars of the Architects Union, um, the Union's group for the study of perspective problems of Soviet architecture, which was led by Alexei Gutnov, who was then the member, one of the leading members of the NER group in the 60s, helped to launch a similar conceptual competition at the old Soviet journal Ar Architectura SSSR. So here's the cover version of that from 1983. Um, and the competition was launched then in December. I think this is an August issue, sadly. The first competition was dedicated to centers of communication and leisure in living areas. So Centra Apshenia i Dosuga Zhilava Komplexa asking the participants to come up with a center in the context of a contemporary microdistrict or housing quarter for any social activity, catering for the hobbies and needs of any, uh, of any age groups. The competition achieved uh, its goals. So it received 351 entries from 60 cities all over the Soviet Union. And as the jury representative, the former NER member Zoya Haritonova commented, it is a pleasure that the journal came up with this initiative, rightly predicting the feelings of its many readers that have an active need for a creative competition and in communication, Apshenia. So the majority of the awarded works saw their role in densifying and adding uh, different functions to the courtyards of micro-district houses or micro-rayon houses in the form of small pavilions for conversation and interconnected plazas that would provide human scale and a space for various activities. A standard courtyard in the Mikrorayon district was in some works tuned, turned into an active environment with small pavilions uh, for meetings, smoking corners, stages for performances and dances, children's playgrounds. So this is for example, Oleg Grigoryev's and Sergei Mihailov's uh, work, which won the second prize. In other works, the articulation of the microrayon into smaller microsquares alongside pedestrian routes was achieved uh, by separating um, uh, brick walls and colonnades that brought variety to the standardized housing district. So here's a Dmitry Shelest and Mihail Korovkov's work. Um, these approaches came close to similar developments in postmodern architecture in the West, where from the un unified spaces of post-war humanism, offering visibility and interconnectedness, there was a shift towards architecture of small scale and subdivision. For example, this, this was supported in theories which asserted that tangible barriers and clearly defined public spaces bring people together and allow them to be more sociable. This is an argument put forward by Richard Sennett in his hugely influential The Fall of Public Man. But I want finally to take a closer look at two, uh, oh, here, sorry, before. There's also Alexander Skokan's project with rather, rather laconic barriers that basically make up a similar uh, separated uh, system of courtyards. But I want to look at uh, two projects that represent the way Apshenia's intercourse, uh, as outlined in the 1960s, was transformed, but at the same time also sustained by the works of the new generation of critical architects. So Georgi Shumakov's work, M Center, proposed to locate centers of communication next to the entrances to underground metro stations. The text written on the board described the daily routine of taking the train to work in the morning and back in the evening mechanical repetition and boredom that accompanied it. Um, this, the work proposed, could be changed by giving it, the citizens an emotional charge, a possibility to participate in creative communication, Apshenia, and the development of culture uh, in centers where one could spend time after work. So you come from out from the metro and there the communication then happens, um, the creative communication then happens uh, there. 
The discussed areas were divided in two interconnected zones by laconic spatial elements. In one part, the high arts were raised um, to a podium. So here, here is the high arts raised to a pedestal for passive enjoyment, including looking at paintings, design, theater decoration. In the other zone, the citizens were invited to actively participate in the production of artworks. So this part here. Um, if here the idea of the creative communication in the socialist society was still seen as relevant, it however existed only a side to the daily grind, something to be enjoyed only on the way home from the places of supposedly still alienated labor. Um, in another work, Mikhail Belovs and Andrei Savins, we grow our club ourselves. The center of communication was on the other hand envisioned as a picturesque garden where different activities were freely spread out all over its territories. Echoing the rhetoric of Nier uh, that was passed to them by their supervisor, uh, Ilya Lejava, one of another leading member of the Nier group, they described communication always taking place according to interests. So that's how they put it. In order to organize communication in a neighborhood, one needs an unusual environment that would attract the inhabitants of the area. It could become the reason for communication, unquote. So instead of adding more architecture to the already existing microdistrict, they proposed a landscape with exotic plants, a lake, hills, small pavilions. We see people watching open-air cinema while taking a dip in the lake, um, following a theater spectacle on the shores, learning to play musical instruments or painting en plein air while listening to music from the headphones, reading books while lying directly on the grass. This optimistic cartoon-like scene had, however, a disturbing frame. Um, a section on the top of the drawing showed the garden to be located inside a huge greenhouse uh, between standard prefabricated housing. The man-made lake inside the center was supported by a complex system of pipes and ducts underneath. The whole landscape turned out to be artificial with controlled climate and infrastructure. The promise of a self-built club stretching across a free territory uh, where the citizens could, able, could be able to enjoy um, in, in alongside Marxist idiom, hunting in the morning, fishing in the afternoon, or rearing cattle in the evening. That's actually another place from the German ideology where Marx envisions the future society. So this kind of free territory turned out to be an illusion. Not only was it separated from the daily life of labor, like the M Center, but with its controlled atmosphere and supportive machinery, this separation was actually the key to its existence. In addition to publishing the winning entries in the competition, of the competition, uh, the journal Ar Architectura SSSR also gave space to a selection of works from the competition that demonstrated the plurality of ideas and forms, as they said. This choice of 16 plates was accompanied by a longer article, a parade of concepts, by the leading critic of the younger generation, Evgeny As, saying that the competition demonstrated an emergence of a new generation of architects. He also acknowledged the difficulty of the competi competition's task, where the participants themselves had to devise the program of their work. In his opinion, it was foremost a competition on the topic of architecture and human relations. And so I read out a longer quote by him. I do not like the term obscenia, communication, although one has to use it out of necessity. It has the air of abstraction and cold estrangement. If one speaks of organizing communication, then it could be imagined as the activity of an organized entertainer, soulless and formal. The true meaning of the problem is seen in the way how architecture is able to influence the relationships between people to provoke and sustain these relationships. So us aim to disassociate the works of his fellow architects from the terms that he associated with a worn out official discourse, with words that reminded him of bureaucratic and devalued language. Even more, for him, for him it was more important to support human values in the urban environment, as he put it, uh, than pay attention to the organization of communication, which lied outside the competency of the architect for him. So quickly to conclude. Um, 
So Abshania, communication, appears then as one of the terms that describes the specific culture of late Soviet modernity, not only related to the unofficial sphere of kitchen conversations as described in many accounts from the 1990s, but something that had also been related to Marxist philosophy and the practices of the future communist city. The competition in 1983 demonstrated on the one hand the importance of continuing influence of the ideas generated during the early Brezhnev period of the 1960s. Yet it also showed a critique of this generation and a major change in ideas, not only relating to Abshania, but also to the role of architecture in society. If Nier uh, saw its project as coming up with the general functional model of the future city together with social scientists, the paper architects were more skeptical towards this kind of collaboration and preferred to see architecture to have clearly defined borders. Finally, it is remarkable to consider the statement by us in the light of the anthropological discussion of Abshania that was related to the unofficial or the deterritorialized milieu. The Abshania professed by Nier and that was related to Marxist philosophy lost its professional actuality almost in the same moment that the cult of informal Abshania seems to have reached its peak. Thank you. So my, my questions would have been on the on the uh, how in in the context of architecture and architectural production and and design and and the sphere of of design and architecture uh, this question of uh, this very vague question of exile which relates to somehow into into exclusion and and displacement uh, how. What what was its uh, what was its pa pa particul particularity in in the sphere of architecture, and and uh, somehow I could I could maybe start by answering myself with something that I picked up from all of your talks. Uh, that first of all that that uh, what, what Clem talked about the 1930s, and and what she didn't mention maybe was that yes Melnikov did this exhibition that was up in for for just a few days. But that actually, in the 30s, many of the architects did continue to work with, with, their, with their own voices. But these voices changed, and they, they stayed in the private. Uh, Melnikov continued to paint within his house. Uh, many others did the same. And, and maybe here, the, the question that becomes different from, from poetry and literature are the, are the means of, of, of distribution. I mean, uh, there are no ways of distributing architecture uh, in this form of, 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 of private creative practice. Uh, or at least then there wasn't, or at least it's not documented. Maybe then, to jump to the 80s, the paper architecture is a form of this type of distribution. Maybe it is some sort of an, an answer to this question of how to distribute architecture in private. Uh, on the other hand, then, uh, what, uh, what uh, Tom talked about, uh, the science cities, that they, in a way, also were one, uh, one answer to this question of not being able to work in the center, that uh, the, the most creative minds uh, moved, uh, started this, established these settlements where, uh, in, in some of them, these houses of culture that were established within them uh, actually acted as, as important spaces for, for the arts. For example, in in uh, in, this, in the atomic city of, of Dubna or Dubn outside Moscow, uh, Solzhenitsyn or Josef Brodsky would read their poems in in the 60s, and Eric Bulatov's first exhibition was organized there. Uh, I mean, for in is this on? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, in my in in my research, I think in looking at creative strategies in the 1970s. The Senna Studio, who I, who I was speaking about, there was a divide between the two heads of the studio that was never resolved. And one, one of the groups decided that they would work with main, uh, mainly with heritage and produce uh, models of how, um, how wooden merchants' houses and, and old buildings that were slated for destruction um, for finding uses for those and then presenting those as um, models to town committees. 
um, as, a, as, a, as a form of, of activism about saving the past. And that related to this idea, these ideas of, 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 of kind of collective memory that you see in, in writers like Aldo Rossi. And they spoke a lot about museification as being a kind of, as, as, as a strategy when the future was no longer possible. And the two projects I showed were produced by Mark Connick, um, who ran this other half of the studio. And they, um, and they very strongly disagreed with um, this uh, idea of museification. They say Lenin didn't say museification of the whole country. Um, in, in, in reference to his, uh, his, his famous line on uh, electrification. And they became very interested in, in kind of space cults that were there in the 70s and cosmism and the projective. And one of their kind of main responses was that um, uh, was, was around the importance of materializing your thought for the future. And I think that metaphor is there really strongly in the Mayakovsky Square project where there's this kind of latent technology that's sitting there, it's materialized, and then one day in the future it may start to move again. Mm -hmm. So it's about kind of continuing to build, mm -hmm. but it's also a sort of building of around a nostalgia of a kind of very short period of time earlier, earlier in their lives. Well, regarding my work, um, the Nier group definitely was not in exile. So they, mm -hmm. they clearly were, um, especially in the mid-60s, uh, true believers. And, um, and um, believing in this moment uh, of a possibility to reform uh, the system and uh, to devise a new communist city, um, which then comes to a crisis at the end of the 60s with a political crisis of Prague, but also uh, the kind of a modernist crisis of, of the new housing areas and, and seeing that this is impossible in a way to uh, turn to a different direction. What I'm interested in more is, is in a way um, partly to um, uh, demystify the paper architecture practice as, a, as an exile um, and, um, and look at it um, in its um, historical and um, and social con or kind of intellectual context and um, kind of trying to find out the threads that some of them go back to the 60s, but also the paper architect architecture, um, I don't know how to call it, movement is by far unified. So there are, there's a lot of very different approaches, very different um, um, personalities and, and um, um, and styles represented. So, so in that sense, I think um, uh, it allows different stories to be told uh, due to that. But, but I think uh, looking back now from the current moment, um, it is interesting in a way to try to find this, what I was starting with, this, this, this specific um, um, elements of the Second World culture that grow out from the system's um, uh, differences from the, from the first and the third world. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think about Melnikov, it's true. I mean, he did continue to paint where he, start, he, he got into his painting, but he was really obsessed with his legacy. So it was kind of like he used to go to the architecture museum every week in the last few years of his life and sit in the director's study and say, next week I will give you my archive. And he never did give them his archive. And he was obsessed and he knew that he was a great architect and he knew that after his death, he'd be really famous. And so he kind of lived for that in a way. And um, he, I mean, as I said, when I spoke, there was a kind of, there's a kind of purity about his legacy because none of the buildings, the kind of really overbearing, I would say, in my opinion, hideous designs that he did in the 30s and 40s were ever built. So we've just got these kind of, this beautiful collection of buildings. Um, but um, so in, it's almost like he died in some ways, like in terms of his oeuvre, because he's not known for his painting and his painting's not so interesting. But um, so it's as if like he died at the height of the terror, like many of the poets, and that is the purity of his legacy, you could say. Brian, 
I was absolutely fascinated by your two accounts because I, I, I was writing about the paper architects when they came here 30 years ago. And uh, apart from Catherine Cook's accounts at that time, we had only a fairly thin understanding of the currents among uh, Soviet architects in the 60s and 70s. And so I, I, I really appreciate seeing that grounding and, and uh, the, 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 the soil from which the paper architects grew. It's, it's evident, it seems to me, that during the 60s and 70s, architects um, who wanted to uh, leaven the heavy bread of mass building in, in Russia were still nevertheless committed to somehow work, working within the system um, and produce reforms of the uh, systems building that was going on. Um, but one gets the feeling that there was, it was in a, 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 a background, a climate of increasing pessimism, the years of stagnation under Brezhnev. And so that there's a point comes in the 80s with the paper architects where they just kind of give up. And the trigger to that seems to have been uh, the Japanese competitions. Um, and uh, the concept of uh, intercourse, or the Russian word, if it's already escaped me, it, it, I suddenly, it suddenly made sense of those drawings by Brodsky and Nutkin and others, which said things like, uh, a conversation in your, in your kitchen table is preferable to a, a vast information exchange. Um, but this seems to me a final point of, of giving up yeah. hope yeah. On, on what had been previously still um, um, some kind of vestigially optimistic Soviet project. Yeah, uh, just to add, I think there's even a, I, I thought of adding this, um, um, I think it's the house of Winnie the Pooh or something like that, which has this kitchen table, two people conversing in this in the middle of all the housing. So in a way that could be con truly is the end point of that right? kind of art that can be drawn from that, from the discussion. So that, that is true. They, they represent a very uh, special fraction in the paper architecture, I think. So, um, um, unlike Belov uh, and uh, Haritonov, um, they were, with Belov and Haritonov, there was this direct connection with Nier through Lezhava, who was their teacher, so that Brodsky and Dutkin were in a different group, so they, they were a bit like um, on, on influenced by some other terms, maybe not so strongly with that uh, Nier ideology. Whereas I think what's kind of very different with Senej is that they were, I think they became very comfortable with the conditions of, of the Brezhnev era. Mm -hmm. And by, and it's very interesting in Paris, when you get to Perestroika, that, um, that Mark Koenig wrote an essay saying why I, called Why I Refuse to Design. And in that he said that the, the era of stagnation was like a material and you could kind of respond to this material and reform and reshape the material. Um, but, you kind of, but you could see that there were certain ideas about what the future society would be, and you could respond to that and engage in some kind of utopian critique. But with perestroika being a process, there was no ability to design on the model that they'd come up with in the 1960s, which was based on, on engaging in these kind of critical responses. Um, so they emerged with a kind of deep discomfort at not being able to, to, to understand the critical environment they inhabited. Um, well, their, their work was, so in the 60s they worked a lot actually with, more with industrial design and machines and they, they had some successful collaborations with the Siberian Academy of Sciences. Um, their work was, um, I mean, one, one thing I found very interesting, because some of the architects who Andres were talking about worked as consultants at the studio, but at the studio these were people who worked in very low positions generally and constructed these big models from cardboard. They had some exhibitions realized. Um, 
Mayakovsky Museum in Moscow, I don't know if people have visited that, but that was, came very much from the school of, of, of Senesh um, and, and, the way, and, and the way in which they kind of constructed things from, from, from card. Um, but the, they had a lot of victory in these heritage projects in preventing buildings from being demolished. So these were intended as, as, um, as agitational projects and they were officially within the area of visual agitation in the Soviet Union of Artists. Um, not, not in a kind of direct building sense, but they, they did affect policies of local cities. Um, but their, I, their aim wasn't to construct. That wasn't what they were trying to do because it wasn't possible. Because it was, what's interesting is all the concept and, and the, and the uh, thinking behind it, all the intellect. And uh, I'm surprised that, that, that it didn't come through in some physical form. Yeah, I mean, I think, in, I mean, it did. I mean, speaking to Yevgeny As, um, Andres mentioned, who is one of the, um, one of the, um, architects who was a consultant at the studio. Um, I mean, he's, he spoke about, you know, these people coming from with very kind of low levels of artistic education from the provinces. And he said, you know, what, mainly what they learned was good taste. So when I've interviewed people like um, one designer, Vladimir Sokolov, who spent most of his career designing visual agitation for collective farms, and he showed me some of the designs for collective farms he made in Siberia. And they looked like Hans Hollein photo montages or something. And like, he's never heard of Hans Hollein, but he's absorbed that through his experience there. So, it manif so I think what they did in their training manifested itself in very strange ways and in very kind of minor um, areas. Um, in, in, in the work of those participants in kind of transforming how they would work on their local assignments in producing propaganda in, in small Soviet cities. That's a good question there. Yeah, could we um, link maybe ideas of Shinya to contemporary Moscow uh, urbanism and public space, which I think is really fascinating. I mean, um, for instance, uh, Mayakovsky Square was very quickly redesigned after 2011. Um, Andres's last uh, image was kind of eerily redolent of the new Diliska Fidio park opposite the Kremlin. Um, and the idea of uh, this, this kind of bourgeois micro rayon um, having been created in these last few years, and these ideas seem to kind of echo in what you see now. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it's, it's an interesting parallel. I was thinking of the Mayakovsky Square myself when you showed the image. Uh, Where they not now have swings, a lot of have big swings. swings. My son was just uh, swinging there half a year ago. We went there, so, you know, it, it, it's funny. It's become like this really child, uh, child uh, playground, and, and then kind of the public, where is the public uh, mm. space in there? So I was wondering, in a way, also, the, it's kind of, well, Maybe it's too general, but it felt like a depoliticized uh, situation. Um, um, other, other, other areas, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of public space development now recently going, going on, but I don't know how directly we can, I don't know the discussions behind that, so I don't know how, if the term of Shenia plays a role, what kind of role it plays there, but yeah, it's an interesting parallel. Yeah, I would say that um, the whole kind of reworking public space in Russia at the moment is the, the idea behind it is very much that the state still controls public space and, and which still remains from Soviet times. And um, so then you can extrapolate what you want from it, like what you think they're trying to achieve with the swings or the park. And it sounds like, I haven't seen the park yet, but I was talking to someone this week who'd just been there and it sounds like something quite wild happening there. Like, he was talking about how it's tapped into some kind of anxiety in Russia about the relationship between the centre and the periphery, which maybe wasn't totally intended when it was commissioned. But um, from my point of view, seeing this kind of cleansing of the public space over the last couple of years, I find it quite, I find it quite oppressive. 
And there's this, on the one hand, we're being told that this is for the public and that it's to create a pleasant space, but I feel this incredibly powerful control behind it and like the clearing away of the kiosks and okay, so the buildings look really amazing and they look like architectural drawings almost, but there is also, there are kind of signs in the metro of how to behave, there's sort of lists of how you behave, the rules, and there's a kind of, there's, there's much more regimentation and control within, within a lot of signage as well, for example. So um, it feels like it's gone a bit extremely the other way. And maybe it'll kind of swing to somewhere in the middle. But I think at the moment we're seeing quite extreme, a quite extreme manifestation of state control in the public space in Moscow. But maybe not everyone would agree with me about that. Yeah, I think it will uh, it will remain to be to be assessed whether there's a connection. I mean, it's an interesting idea that actually some of these visual visual ideas or, or ideas have now somehow been built. But I would say it's too early to say. Okay, I think now it's time for me to thank everyone who who, who came to talk and who stayed here. I'm from Finland, and in Finland we have this saying that. Uh, uh, when the number of people at the party gets smaller, the party gets better. <laughs> so I think now it's a good time to, to uh, loosen up and have a drink and uh, buy a book. Marcus, can I just say, can I just thank Minija as well for organizing it and, and for the collaboration with Pushkin House. We really appreciate it. We're really happy to have come here tonight. So thank you. And thank you for Andres and Tom, who, who really, as, as Brian Hatton said, uh, the new generation of researchers who will really like open up these things and and really like unveil all the the hidden narratives beyond the 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 groupings underneath such terms as dissident and exile thank you